Revelation chapter 12. Uh, give it up for Josh Carlson, our resident drummer. He's uh, out golfing tonight, uh, but he made that whole bumper. Uh, did an awesome job. That's one of my favorite bumpers that we've had. So cool. So cool. He's not here to hear us cheering for him, but as you see him, let him know you thought it was great work because it was really great work. Okay, so our text, we don't, you don't need to stick the verse on there yet. We don't want to distract people with reading. Uh, <laughs> Just stick the main screen up there. Our, our, our text that we're pulling this whole series from is out of Matthew chapter 16. You don't have to turn there, but it's a conversation that Jesus has with the religious figure. And, and this religious figure, and I'm sorry, with his disciples. It's a conversation with his disciples, and he's asking them, who do people say that I am? Because, you know, everyone has an opinion about who Jesus is. There's all sorts of ideas floating out there. And that's true for us today. Everyone's got an opinion. Everyone's got an idea about who Jesus is. And so his disciples give him all these answers. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist. Others say you're some great prophet. And, and as you saw on, on our lovely bumper screens, right, some people today have all kinds of opinions about Jesus. Some people say, well, he's just, just a myth. He wasn't real. Other people say, well, he's this great historical figure, but that's all. Others will say, well, he's this great prophet. But the most important question that Jesus ever asked shows up in this passage, and he turns this question back on his disciples. He says, I know everyone thinks I'm someone. Everyone's got an idea about who I am. But, Peter, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? And that's the question that I want to challenge you guys with for this series. Who do you say that Jesus is? Because it does not matter who your mom says Jesus is. does not matter who your teachers say that Jesus is. Doesn't matter who political figures, Instagram influencers, important or non-important people say that Jesus is. All that matters is who do you say that Jesus is. Yeah. Right. And if you say, like I do, that Jesus is the suffering servant, like we talked about last week, who suffers for our sin, who bears the wrath of God so we don't have to anymore. If you believe, like I do, that Jesus is the serpent slayer, which is what we're going to talk about tonight, how Jesus defeats the powers of evil and sin and darkness in our world. If you believe that Jesus, like we're going to talk about next week, make sure you come back with some friends because they need to hear the most important message the Bible has to tell next week that Jesus is the crucified king. If you believe like I do that this stuff is true, it changes everything. Yeah. Changes everything. That's right. So my challenge for you is maybe you're a skeptic, maybe you're all in. Either way, I, what I'd like you to do is listen to what I have to say not just I have to say, listen to what the Bible has to say about who Jesus is, and then make up your mind for yourself. I'm not going to tell you who to think Jesus is. You're going to have to decide that for yourself. What I'm going to do is I'm going to present you what the Bible says. Because the Bible has some stuff to say. Now, the, the end of this passage, and you can stick this up, Matthew 16, verse 17. You can stick that up on the screen. At, at, at the end of this, because Peter answers Jesus' question, he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And here's Jesus' answer. And can you stick that up for me, Jesse? Matthew chapter 16, verse 17, all the way to verse 17 at the end. Well, wait a second, because I think it's such a powerful verse. I want you all to see it. Verse 17. Sorry. Hey, you guys don't know how hard it is to run that computer back there. It's super slow. You click. It takes five million years to go through. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For, look at this, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Hold, leave, leave that up on there for a second. Listen, if you want to see Jesus for who he really is, if you want to get a full, clear, LASIK surgery picture of who Jesus is, no glasses necessary, you're not going to figure it out on your own. You need it revealed to you. That's why we need this book. Because I'm not going to figure out who Jesus is on my own. All I'm going to get is another opinion. What I need to figure out is who God says Jesus is. I need it revealed to me by the Father who's in heaven. Listen to me. If you're here, if you're a Christian, you're not a Christian by accident. You're a Christian because the Father in heaven revealed Jesus to you. And now everything's changed. And if you're here tonight, and you're kind of, I don't know about this Jesus stuff. Like, my friends are really into it. This trademark's fun, so I'm here for a fun time. Like, but if you will get a hold of Jesus, if you will let the Father reveal to you who Jesus is, it's going to change everything. Yeah. 
All right, so let's turn now to Revelation chapter 12. Let's see what the Bible has to say about who Jesus is. So the book of Revelation, before we read this, we're just going to put, put it all on the table. Revelation's a weird book. This verse is a weird passage. Like, even, look at it right there. There's a war in heaven, angels fighting a dragon. That's wild stuff. And now, if you don't understand how to read this book, you're going to come away thinking Adam is a nut job. Pastor Adam's crazy because he thinks there's dragons and angels and demons. And I do. I do. But I don't think there's literally a dragon. I don't think there's literally this war going on. I think this is poetic, figurative, prophetic language designed to give us a picture of reality that is so much bigger and truer than we could ever understand. See, here's what this is. This, this, this passage here, this is a picture of what Jesus did when he died on the cross. This weekend, this Friday is Good Friday. We celebrate on Good Friday the death of Jesus. Then we celebrate on Sunday the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus died, came back from the dead. That's what we celebrate. Now, while he's hanging on the cross, this is what's happening. Okay, so now we're going to read from Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. We're going to go through verse 12. Now, war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but Woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. This is the word of the Lord. She knows. All right, so that's kind of a weird passage, right? Like, that's weird. That's weird. Dragons, angels, fighting, dragon thrown down to earth, Satan, all this stuff. But what this is, this is a description of what's happening. As Jesus is hanging on the cross, this is what's going on. There's a war being fought in heaven. And here's the first thing, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Evil has an expiration date. That's what this verse teaches us. This verse teaches us that because of Jesus, because of what Jesus did on the cross, evil has an expiration date. First thing this tells us, a war arises in heaven. And this is language. It's, it's giving us a picture. As Jesus hangs on the cross, as he calls out, it is finished. This is what's happening. There's war being fought in heaven. There's war going on. And Jesus gives his life to ensure victory. We're going to talk about this more in a minute. But I need you to know you are at war. Yeah. You are caught up in a war. Whether you see it or not, whether you know it or not, you are in the middle of war between the powers of evil and darkness and the power of God. Let me tell you, the battle has been fought and the war has been won and the victory is ensured because Jesus died on the cross. Evil has an expiration date. Satan's being thrown down to the earth, stripped of all his power. Jesus is victorious. And so evil has an expiration date because the war was already fought. See, we see evil in our world today, and we hate the evil in our world, right? We hate the injustice that we see. We hate the, the terrible fighting that we see between people. We hate the murder of little kids that we see all the time. We hate all this stuff. It's awful. There's war going on. But listen, we're not fighting that war. There's a whole different war going on. The war that we're engaged in isn't, isn't a war of politics. It's not a war of ideologies. It's a war of, are you following Jesus? Are you following the dragon? Whose side are you on in this? Are you following the way of Jesus? Are you loving your neighbor as yourself? Are you living this life of kindness and generosity, of sacrificing your life for the good of others? Are you living a life that says, hey, I'm going to kill the sin in my heart and in my life? Or are you living for the dragon? What side of this war are you on? Are you living for yourself? Are you living for your own pleasure, your own comfort, your own opinions and ideas and thoughts? That's the war that we're in. 
The battle's being waged. The dragon's been thrown down. This image of the dragon, this is the image of the snake all the way from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And we can throw that up on the screen. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is, we know the story of Genesis 3, right? Adam and Eve are in the garden. Paradise, everything's good. We go back to this over and over. This, this is the most important story the Bible has to tell for shaping our view of the world. Humans and God, and humans reject the wisdom of God. They eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They reject God's wisdom and say, I'm going to be a God for myself. I know better than you, God. I'm going to eat this fruit. I know what's up. The moment they do it, sin enters the world. Brokenness enters the world. Disease enters the world. Racism enters the world. Every single ill and, and evil and problem you can think of, it all comes back to this. Yeah. All comes back to the issue, this issue right here. And, and this is God's response to sin. And we know the story. Eve's tempted by this snake. The snake talks to her and says, hey, you're smarter than God. God doesn't know what's up. Eat this fruit. Eat this tree. You'll, you'll, you'll be all right. This is what God says to the snake. He says, I will put enmity, that just means fighting, difficulty, war. I'll put war between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. A lot of Bible nerds say this is the first prophecy about Jesus. Jesus is that guy at the bottom there. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The offspring of the woman, the offspring of humans, and the offspring of the snake, the offspring of the dragon. This is a story that we follow through the whole Bible. And, and it comes to a climax in Jesus, the, the ultimate offspring of the woman, the Virgin Mary, born. And the powers of sin and darkness that gather and, and corroborate together to kill Jesus. And on the cross, as he breathes his last breath, as he says, it is finished. Revelation tells us, this is what's happening. There's war being fought in heaven, and the dragon's being thrown down to the earth. The victory that was promised 2,000 pages ago, some tens of thousands of years ago, this war is won in that moment on the cross. And so because of Jesus, evil has an expiration date. The power of sin and darkness dating all the way back to the garden is broken. And so do you mourn sin and injustice in the world? Well, look to the cross because the victory has been won. Do you feel threatened by the power and the presence of evil? Well, look to the cross because the victory is won. Are you just terrified of disease and sickness? COVID like got you freaked out a little bit? Well, look to the cross, because evil is beaten in the power of Jesus. It may not feel like it, but this is the true reality. The death of Jesus has assured our victory over evil in this world. We'll read on in verse 9. The next thing you can write down, live not by lies. Live not by lies. Because we're told something about this dragon. He's thrown down to the earth, and we're told in verse 9 that he is the Satan the deceiver of the whole world. The deceiver of the whole world. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Can you stick that up on the screen for us to see? Revelation 12, 9. He's the deceiver of the whole world. He's thrown down to the earth. So here's what this means. Here's what this means. On the earth, there's a deceiver at work. What does a deceiver do? He deceives. What does a liar do? He lies. And so you need to know because you're at war. Because there's a dragon on the earth. Jesus has given you the victory. He, he's promised that the, the war is going to be won. But now this dragon is on the earth. And we're waiting for the day when the war is going to be fo totally finished. Right? Jesus stuck, struck the first blow. He kicked the dragon out of heaven. N now the dragon's much less powerful than he was before. But he's still on the earth. He's still fighting. And we have a part to play in this war. We have a part to play in killing this dragon. And pushing back darkness and evil. Now we're assured of victory. We're assured the evil has an expiration date. Because of what Jesus did. But in this world, we need to know there's a dragon out there. And he's always whispering to you. John 8, 44 tells us that he is the father of lies. That every single thing that he says is a lie. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. He's a liar. The father of lies. And you need to know there's a dragon in this world who's whispering in your ear day and night. Night and day. And he won't shut up. And the problem is you believe him every time. You're just suckered in by the lie. Now, and I don't mean to say this in an accusingly mean tone. What I want to do is I want to give you an apocalyptic moment. I want to open your eyes. I want to help you realize the truth. But there's all sorts of lies you're believing. He's telling you lies day and night, and you've bought right in. Here's the, the worst lie. 
that the dragon tells you all the time, you can't pray. You, you hear this all the time. How many of you think you're bad at prayer? Just honest, honest, right? Y'all are not being honest. Y'all are not being honest. Be honest. You think, I'm just not great at prayer. Kind of bad at it. Yeah, over 50% of the room, right? If we're honest, if we're honest, like, I don't know what to pray. I don't know what to say. That's a lie, and you believe it. Yeah. That's a lie that you believe. Be, be, and the way I know it's a lie is because you can say, God, I don't know how to pray, and that's a prayer. Yeah. That's a prayer. But, but we think, hey, man, I have, to all the, I have to have all these fancy words. It has to sound just right. It has to be so perfect. It has to last for a certain amount of time. And, and the honest truth is, you know how to pray way better than you think you know how to pray. Yeah. Literally. God, help me. That's a prayer. God, help me to fight evil right now. God, there's sin in my life and I'm pissed off. God, that's a prayer. That's a prayer. Am I allowed to say piss? Give me a ruling. Yeah? yeah? Okay, yeah. cool. Thanks. Thanks. Leaders approve. We're good. We're good. Another lie. Another lie that you hear all the time, and you just believe it. The lie that says you can't understand the Bible. How many of you like read this book and like, man, I don't know what this is saying. Can't make heads or tails of it. I don't, I don't got a clue. And that's a lie. And we just believe it. We just believe it. But this book, you can understand it. You can read it. You can comprehend it. And I know you can because you guys show up to Bible studies on the second and fourth Thursday of every month at 4 p.m. Shameless plug. You show up to Bible study, and then you do it. And like, every time I'm like, oh yeah, you guys are great at studying the Bible. But you believe this line, so you're like, man, I can't read the Bible on my own. I can't figure it out without Pastor Adam. I, I can't figure it out without texting one of the youth leaders or one of the students who like seem like they know what's going on. But listen, you can read the Bible. Yeah. You can figure it out. Stop believing the lie. Because what, what the enemy does, he lies at the points that are most important. So, so if you would pray, if you would read your Bible, if you would jump into the fight and get off your butt, like you would be a terror to the powers of hell and evil. And so what's he going to do? He's going to lie to you day and night because he's terrified of you. The dragon is terrified of what would happen if you got into the fight, of what would happen if you opened up that book and read it every day. If you'd get down on your knees and plead with God for your friends, plead with God for your family, plead with God for your schools, you know what would happen? You'd start to see things happening. You'd start to see real change go on. The dragon's terrified, so he lies to you day and night. You don't know how to pray. You don't know how to read your Bible. You can't figure this stuff out. He's lying non-stop. So live not by lies. Live not by lies. Reject the lies that the enemy tells. How do you know the difference between truth and lie? Well, if you go to the government office where they study all the counterfeit bills and they try to figure out, is this a real $100 bill or is this one that Ari printed off her press again? She's bad at that. Darn it. You know how they do it? They don't study all the fakes. They don't try to learn all the different lies. They sit around and they study the real thing. Yeah. Day and night. They look at every single detail and so they know the difference between a real and a fake a lot of times just by touching it and feeling it. So you want to know how you tell the difference between a truth and a lie? You bury your nose in this thing. It's no surprise that the number one lie that the devil tells is you can't figure this book out. Because yeah. if you would, you'd start to realize, oh, that's a lie. Because this thing's plain. Stop believing the lies. Live not by lies. We've got to keep moving. I'm having too much fun. Okay, verse 10. Verse 10. I love this. This is, if I was going to list off my favorite verses in the Bible, this would be somewhere on that list. I don't know what level, what spot. Let's get Revelation 12, verse 10 on the screen. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And I don't even have time to unpack this verse, because there's so many great words in there that we could study and look at. But what I want to focus your attention to is that last bit. The accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. This is what used to happen. So what used to happen, kind of in the whole workings of the spiritual world, Right? And we, we pretend this doesn't exist because we're American Christians. We know better than the Bible. We know that spirits aren't real. It's a load of crap. We believe our kind of Western worldview that says if it's spiritual, it must be fake. Talk about lies that the devil wants to pull and trick us and pull us out of the truth of reality. But this is what used to happen. What used to happen is Satan would sit in front of God's throne 
day and night, and he just watched you. Hey, Caden screwed up again. Ah, Maddie's sinning again. God, did you see that? Did you see what she just did? I saw it. Did you see it? He's laughing. Man, do you know what Titus just said? God, did you hear that? Of course God heard it. He knows everything. But he's just, he's just pointing out every little flaw, every little thing. Man, Travis screwed up again. I caught him. I saw it. I saw it. Day and night, day and night, just accusing you, accusing you, accusing you before God. What does this tell us? The accuser was thrown down. So what does this mean for you? Because of the cross, because of Jesus, there is no accuser against you in heaven. You need to hear this. There's no accuser against you in heaven. So where's your sin? Where's your shame? God don't see it because there's no accuser in heaven. Here's how Paul describes this, Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 through 15. We need to read this because it's just so, so powerful. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. Here's what it says. You who were dead in your trespasses, the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities. Put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Here's what it says. Because of Jesus, all your sin, all your shame, the record of debt, the long list of every sin that you ever made, the long list of every bad thing you ever did, every bad thing you ever thought, every bad thing you ever looked at, that long list, God took it. He said, that's done. I'm not looking at that anymore. I don't need that anymore. That's over because of Jesus. Your sin is gone. Yeah, you can clap for that, right? That's powerful. That's powerful. Your sin is gone. <laughs> That's funny. Your sin is gone. Your shame is gone. Your guilt is gone. There's no accuser in heaven. There's no accuser in heaven. That's right. Get up here and preach. Come on. Come on, past, present, future. It's gone. It's gone. Your sin and your shame is nailed to the cross. Here's what this means. For the believer, for the believer, every nail in the hand of Jesus is the nail in the coffin of your sinful past. Every nail in the hand of Jesus is a nail in the coffin of your sinful past. It's gone. There is no accuser in heaven. And listen, if you're here and you're like, man, I don't know if I'm on team Jesus. I don't know if that's true for me. Look right at me. There's no accuser in heaven for you either. All you have to do is give your allegiance to King Jesus. You follow Jesus and this is your story. Every shame, every, every guilt, every sin, it's tore up, it's gone. God don't see it. All he sees is his son. All he sees is Jesus. And yet, we so often live burdened by shame. We live burdened by guilt. And this should not be so. 1 John 1, 9 tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what happens when you're caught up in the middle of sin? When, when, when you're struggling with shame? When you're struggling with guilt? You run to the Father. You confess that thing. You drag it into the light. You drag it out of darkness. What do you do when you're at trademark with your friends? You confess that sin. You drag it out of the light. You say, hey, listen. Josh, come over here. I need to tell you something. Like, you can sit down. But, hey, dude, I'm just struggling right now. Can you pray for me? I've been, man, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. That's what you do. That's what you do. And now, now, look at me. You got, you got a partner in the fight. You got an ally with you. You got someone on your side. You're not fighting alone. See, we lose this war all the time because we fight on our own. But if you pull someone aside, say, hey, hey, listen, listen, Ari. Now, this recommendation, if you're a guy... Find a really good guy friend to confess your sin to. If you're a lady, find a really good lady friend to confess your sin to. Don't, like, do this cross-gender. It just gets messy and weird, guys. I've seen it, seen it go wrong too many times. But, 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 now you've got an ally. So you run to your father. You run to your brothers and sisters. You drag that sin out of darkness into the light. And what happens? He's faithful and just. Forgive us our sins. Cleanse us from all, all unrighteousness. No sin, no shame. Here's the last thing we got to do. I'm right on time. Verse 11 through 12. So you know you're in this war. You know there's all these lies nonstop. You know you got victory. So what do you do? You embrace on earth 
what was accomplished in heaven. You embrace on earth what was accomplished in heaven. Accuser of our brothers, he's been thrown down. Verse 11, Revelation 12. And they have conquered him. By what? Blood. The blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives, even unto death. And therefore, rejoice, O heavens, you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. We're at war. We're at war. Dragons on the earth. He's roaring. The Bible tells us he's a roaring lion, but he's a toothless lion. He's got no power. All he's got is a lie. Look at me. The, bit, the biggest, the best weapon the dragon has against you in your life is a lie. So if you can reject that lie, if you can believe the truth, if you can start to live out truth, you got victory. You got victory. The war's already won. He got the teeth taken out of him. He got his head stomped. Dragon got bounced. Embraced on earth what was accomplished in heaven. Victory's yours. So now walk in it. Now live in it. See, this, the, the problem is we stop here a lot of times. We stop. I, I, I got a meme in there. Got a meme in there, Jesse. Will you put that meme up on the screen? This is you. Leave that up there for a minute. This is you. This is you. You're living at war. You're living in this sin. You're living in the world. You're, you're living, listening to all these lies and believing them. You're sitting the houses on fire and you're saying, this is fine. This is fine. Nothing's wrong. No problem. It's not fine. The house is on fire and you're, the house is on fire and you're a firefighter. This is so wrong. Like, do you, do you catch that? The house is on fire and you're a firefighter. Put out the fire. Get up off your butt and get into the fight. Go to war. There's a war raging. Everywhere you look, you're at war. You walk through the halls of your school, you're at war. You log into Zoom school, you're at war. You get up in the morning and you start doing the chores, you're at war. Every moment of your life, you are at war. And I need you to get your eyes up off of your life, up off of yourself, up off of your own self-pity, and look up and see the world is burning all around you. The world's going to hell in a handbasket, and you have the answer. Don't hold it into yourself. Go to war. Get up and start fighting. There, there's a battle, and you got a part to play in it. Biggest lie the devil tells us by far, by far, is that life is normal. It's all good. Yeah. Everything's good right now. I'm chilling. Life's good. Life is perfect. Someone told me that the other day. I was like, I'm not going to out you. I know who you are. You know who you are. You're like, life is perfect. Is life really perfect? Life really perfect? You beating every sin that you're fighting? You got this great relation with your parents? School's all great. Your grades are perfect. Life perfect really for you? But, but we walk around and we say, life's fine. It's all good. I'm blessed and highly favored. No, it's not. The world's on fire. Sin is in this world. Suffering is in this world. We live in this sex-crazed culture that just tries to normalize every sexual desire that you have. That's not normal. Yeah. Profanity everywhere left and right. And you're just told, it's fine, it's fine, no problem, no issue. Boys and girls can't even figure out how to be boys and girls. Yeah. Like, this isn't fine. I literally saw from a major news network yesterday a tweet saying, like, you have to normalize... Transgender culture, like, I'm going to do it, <laughs> all right? Yeah. You're my witness. What you were born with is what you are. This is what normal is. Yeah. And you have a world out there trying to tell you boys can be girls and girls can be boys. And the stories that we hear from tons of people who are now trying to detransition because they realize that I thought I was a girl at 15, and it turns out it was just weird 15-year-old hormones. Yeah. And now their life is ruined, and it's a mess. Y'all can cancel me all you want, but this is the truth, and you got to hear it from someone. Yeah. This is not fine. This is not normal. I see so many posts day and night, normalize this, normalize that. No, it's not normal. 
you're at war. There's a fire going on. And what I need you to do, start getting into war. Start getting into the fight. Start fighting. You want to beat the dragon? Here's how you do it. Last five minutes. Here's our game plan. You want to beat the dragon? You want to kill sin? You want to do this? All right. Here's how we do it. Here's how we do it. First thing. First thing. Look at your life. Kill the sin in your life. Don't normalize the sin that you're dealing with. You got a porn addiction? Kill that thing. Kill that thing. You got a language problem? Monitor your mouth. What kind of stuff are you listen to? Garbage in, garbage out. You got a terrible relationship with your parents? Well, start taking some steps to fix that. Listen, you start reading the book of Proverbs, it's going to tell you all about how to have a healthy, happy relationship with your parents. Your friends are a mess. You, you, you got strife and problems with your friends. All right, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 18. Look at your life. Where's the problem? Start working on it. Start fixing it. We got to grow. We got to grow up. We got to get out of sin. We got to get out of shame. We got to move on because we're at war. And you are a key player. But the enemy just wants to lie to you. He wants to tell you everything's normal, keep you in your little box, keep you in chains, keep you behind bars, and get you out of the picture. But if you would get out of that box, and you'd kill some sin, and you'd step up to the plate, you'd see so much victory happen in your family. You'd see God do so much in your school. You'd see so much happen with your friends. Get up and get to war. This is what I want for you more than anything else. More than anything else is for you to realize I'm in a battle and I have a part to play and I can do something. You can do something. You are not insignificant. First Timothy tells us, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. There's a command to a 20-year-old pastor. And this is my word to you at 11 years old, at 15 years old, at 18 years old. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Don't think just because you're a kid, you don't got nothing to do. You have a part to play in this war. You can make so many things happen for the gospel. You make so many things happen for Jesus. I'm not just talking like good vibes and positive energy. I'm talking about your school being transformed into everyone following Jesus and showing up to church on a Sunday and a Wednesday. That is possible. And every time you believe the lie that that's not, you're losing the battle. There's no reason that your friends can't follow Jesus. There's no reason your school can't be set on fire with the power of God. There's no reason. If you step up, get into battle. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. I want to make sure I hit on this before we finish. It tells us that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You're at war, so fight the right enemy. Yeah. Fight the right enemy. Remember, your fight is not a political fight. It's not an ideological fight. It's not a popularity fight. It's not a follower's fight. It's not a fight to just how much controversy can I stir up. That's not fighting. You're just contributing to the problem. Look at me. When you try to be as controversial as possible as you can, you're just contributing to the, That's the dragon. You're fighting on the wrong side. Yeah. Get off that side. Stop trying to fight a political battle. Stop trying to fight an ideological battle. Stop trying to fight an opinion-based battle. Get into the fight. You're not fighting a person. You're not fighting a party. You're not fighting a culture or a race. We're not fighting a culture war. The Satan is working day and night to bring division and hatred into our world. And every time that you contribute to division... Every time you contribute to divisiveness, every time you contribute to that person sucks, they're an idiot, they're terrible, you're fighting on the side of the dragon and you're not fighting for Jesus. You're fighting against everything that Jesus stands for. So stop fighting for division. Stop fighting for condemnation. Stop fighting for shaming other people. Stop fighting for cancel culture. That's not your war. In your zeal to eliminate hatred, be careful that you don't become an Anakin Skywalker. Episode three, burning in lava. Now you become the very thing you swore to destroy. Yeah. Grew up on those movies, and that, that line is still terrifying to me because this is what we do. We become the very thing that we think we're fighting. Yeah. So don't do it. Your battle, your battle, kill sin. Kill sin. And you're going to hear me say that maybe every week because I mean it every week. Kill sin. 
follow Jesus. Get on your knees and cry out for your school and for your friends. You think prayer doesn't do anything? That's a lie that you're believing from the enemy. Get on, get on your knees and cry out. God, save my friend. God, save my school. God, save my parents. God, save my teachers. And maybe it's the same prayer every day for the next five years. But listen, God hears those prayers, and prayer does something. Yeah. If you think it doesn't, you're believing a lie. Yeah. Kill sin. Get on your knees and pray. Cry out to God. And we fight, not with fire, not with weapons of this world. We fight with the weapons of Jesus. We follow the way of Jesus. We live a life of love. We live a life of grace. We live a life of kindness. You want to beat back the power of the dragon? This is how you do it. And then the lie is going to start coming in. He's going to start saying, well, this, you're, a, you're just a pushover. You're just so soft. You're just such a weenie. But that's how you win the war. Not by engaging in the violence of the snake. Not by engaging in the hatred and the vitriol of our world and our culture. Yeah. But engaging in the way of Jesus. A life of humble, self-sacrificial love for everyone. So what do you do? I'm going to get home and I'm going to do the dishes without being asked. And listen to me, that, that is a fight. You're fighting the snake. You're fighting for love and kindness, and it feels like nothing. It feels like this tiny little thing, but you're fighting the right battle. What are you going to do? I'm going to do my homework when my parents tell me to do it, and I'm not going to get on Fortnite. And it's like, man, but, but that, that, that is the fight. It's these little things. See, we think it's this big thing. It's like, man, I got to go to Africa and get in the jungle and preach to the natives. Most of those natives have churches and, and pastors already preaching to them. Hey, hey, if you want to be a missionary, like, no shame, no shame, no shame. That's good. That's awesome. But like, don't think doing big things for God means I got to go to Bible college. I got to get a degree. And then I got to learn how to do what Pastor Adam does and stand up on stage and talk about the Bible. Yeah. That's just not what it is. Like, that's good. I love what I do. I'm glad people like me exist. But you want to get in the fight? It's the little things. Love, kindness, obedience, patience. Yeah. All right. I'm past my time. Get in the fight. Get in the fight. War has been won because Jesus has won it. The last, the last thing it says here, verse 12, he knows that his time is short. So hold fast and fight back because victory is guaranteed. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you gave us this book to encourage us, to strengthen us, to challenge us, to get in the fight. Lord, I pray for every person in this room that they would recognize the battle that they are engaged in on a daily basis. And that they would pick a side. they jump on the side of King Jesus and his kingdom. Lord, if there's someone here who's like, man, this is just my, I don't know what's going on. It's my first time. I'm confused. Lord, would you open their eyes? We, we saw earlier that we don't know who you are unless you reveal it to us. Would you reveal that truth to us? Lord, give us the strength Give us the power. Give us the energy to fight this war. We thank you. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Jesus, Jesus, you are, you are better, better than, anything than anything in this world. In this world. Love you guys. Have a great night.